Today is December 9th, 2014, and we are interviewing Robert Baltazar at Chicago Public Library Clearing Branch. Mr. Baltazar was born on 7-14-1938. My name is Cheryl Walker and I'll be interviewing Mr. Baltazar. Barbara Johnston will be the court reporter for this interview. Robert, where were you born? I was born on the west side of Chicago on uh, July 14, 1938 to uh, Hope and Marshall Baltazar, my parents. What did they do for a living? My father was a musician and because we came from a large family, my mother was basically a housewife. There was 12 in our family. There was 12 in your family? 12 in our family, nine boys and one girl. Mine. Okay, um, so did how, any of your siblings serve in this military? None of my children serve, no. No, your brothers and sisters? Yes, uh, four of my brothers, including myself, served in the Armed Forces. Were you in the um, service at the same time? Uh, no, uh, my brother Eddie, who was the second one, I was in the service first and he came in about a year and a half later. So we were for maybe a year in the same, he was in Germany and I was in Texas. Are you the oldest? Of I'm, uh, well, I'm the oldest who served, but there's a brother older than me. Okay. What were you doing before you entered the service? I was going to high school and I had graduated in uh, June of 56 and uh, my life was uh, pretty quiet and I just uh, decided to, I decided to go into the military to give back to my country, something that, uh, something I can do and make, make them proud of me. And what um, branch of service were you in? I went in the U.S. Army. Okay. okay. Um, can you tell us about the early days of your service? Where did you go for basic training? Well, we went, uh, I was kind of shocked because we went downtown and got on the train in Union Station and being a private, they didn't tell me too much. And the train pulled out and I was kind of, well, I guess I was scared. And the train went to Fort Leonard, Missouri and they let us out and they put us in a withholding company because we didn't have uniforms. So for about two weeks, we were like a ragtag outfit. And then we went to uh, a big building where they, quartermaster, where they, fed, where they fed us and dressed us and that was it. So about a week later we started uh, in a company and we started boot camp. What was your company? It was company B of the engineer's outfit and we started there. So it was, uh, it was quite uh, difficult at first because it was physical. And uh, as time went on, I got, well, I was a young boy, 18 years old, so it wasn't that hard. But uh, there was a lot of discipline, and you had to listen and behave and do what you had to do. So I just decided to not give anybody trouble and work hard. Do you remember some of your um, boot camp um, friends? Uh, there was uh, El, El Haliste and uh, Lenny Colin and just a couple of people that I knew that I met for the first time and uh, it was just a lot of work and a lot of people there and when you were finished you were just so tired you didn't have time to maybe write a letter home. What did you think um, would was what do you remember as the most difficult? Oh, I think uh, I was never away from home. 
And uh, the first year we were there for Thanksgiving, and it was just uh, at at home. We always got together and had a big dinner, and and we were the, my brothers and I are very tight, even today. So being away was hard, but uh, you get used to you know, get used to things, and you just got to pick up and after yourself and go on. But that was one of the toughest things I had to do. After boot camp, where did you go? Well, after boot camp, I finished boot camp, and they gave me orders to go to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. So I went there, and I they put me in a school for drafting and uh, illustrations, and I always had a little hand in artwork. So I took some tests, and they sent me there. And I was there for about eight weeks. And uh, like I said before, I marched in the Eisenhower's inauguration parade. So that was something. And where was that at? That was on Pennsylvania Avenue, right downtown. And you showed me a picture of a float. Is that when you made that float? No, no. That was when. Uh, after I had finished there, I was sent to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and I was assigned to uh, Army Medical Service School, which did all the work for Brooks Army Hospital. So going back to marching into the Eisenhower inaug inauguration parade, um, did your unit do that? Did the whole base do it? I think uh, there was uh, our the whole base went out, and the Air there was Air Force, Marines, and every branch of the service was there. So it was really a big highlight in my life just to be a part of that. So I felt like uh, a small way I was giving back a little bit. Did you get to see it? Meet Eisenhower? Well I didn't. I, I, I saw where they were sitting but there were so many people sitting there that we, we passed by rather quickly. I think I saw him but I can't be sure. Do you remember? Did you salute him? Uh, yes, as we walked by, we, we the whole company saluted. Okay, so after engineering school, our drafting and um, was that Company B also? Yeah, that was Company B. Okay. Um, you said you went to Texas. Where in Texas? Okay, I went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, which is located right outside of uh, San Antonio, Texas, and they put me in a. Uh, we were attached to Brooks Army Medical Center, Company B, the first battalion, and we did everything for the school. They were te they were uh, teaching doctors and nurses, and that's when I found out that there was a lot of Vietnam doctors there, and they were learning, and and then we would uh, go out on the field and put up uh, mash outfit tents and everything and the doctors were training out in the field. So you were at the beginning of gearing up for the Vietnam? Yes, because when I got out of the, the service, they, were, they wanted me to re-enlist, and they were sending the hospitals to Asia, to, you know, Vietnam. So you actually, your unit, were you the ones that actually assembled the mass units, putting up the... Well, everybody, we had uh, a unit of carpenters and electricians and whatever, and everybody would do their part. And we were the, what they call the firepower for, we would set up gun displacements around there and uh, put out the big the thing outside so the helicopters can land, and that's what we used to do. One thing you you mentioned to me was putting on makeup. Well, they had a, a person come in from, from California and he taught us makeup. And the reason we did that because we would get the troops out there and do artificial cuts on there and, and then their legs are broken and whatever. And then the doctors would come in and they would say this one goes to tent one, this one tent two, this, and then they would put them in there and they would treat them. So it was uh, a new concept that the, uh, the Colonel, Colonel Hack decided to come up with. So it was very interesting. I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And I used to, when we were out in the field, the doctors would say, I want to sign here for women's and men's and 
surgical, so we would have to make up a sign right away and put it up. Mm -hmm. What kind of hours did you work? Well, being away from home, I didn't really, we worked all, all kind of hours. And uh, one day, w we would work maybe four straight days, and they'd give us a couple of days off. And, uh, but the, uh, basically when we were, we mostly worked seven to maybe about five, four o'clock. And then we would go have lunch and we were finished. Did you live in a barracks? We lived in a barracks, uh, big barracks, those pictures I showed you. And they were maybe 100, 100 people living in each barrack. But as you got to your rank, then they gave you a room with four people. And what was the rank that you had when you were... Um, I was uh, what they call an E5, and that was a uh, specialist fifth class. So I was pretty lucky because I made rank rather quickly. I was 19 years old and I was marching troops and everything, inspections, troops, and uh, I did... Uh, I was sergeant of the guard where I used to post people. And CQ, when uh, the company was over, somebody would sit in the, in the, in the office and all night and, and make sure that there was no fires or nobody got hurt or and you had to take over completely. So you lived on base the whole time? Yeah, I lived on base uh, most of the time, but while I was there, I did get married. You did? Yeah, I got married rather young. In fact, my wife is still my wife today. Congratulations. So we uh, moved off post. But uh, it was kind of difficult because a lot of times I would go away for three, four days. And in those days, there was no cell phone. So I couldn't call her and say, I'm going away, you know. So. Talking about communications, how did you keep in touch with your family? You said it was difficult with your wife. Well, it was mostly just mail. Because they used to have what they call a telephone post on base. But you could never get... You know, you go over there and there was thousands of men calling on the phone, so it was difficult to get a line out, you know. So we just, just wrote letters. That was it. Did you enjoy a mail call? Oh. Well, my wife went back home. She went back home, and uh, my daughter was born, so she went back home with her mother. So it, but the last six, seven months, I was alone, so it was difficult. But I had a lot of work to do, so I kept busy, you know. And uh, when I finished, after three years, I was on what they call a reserve for three more years. And then I got my final discharge. But uh, I felt good because uh, I had, when I first went in, I had to set an example for my brothers because they were to follow. So we all served and uh, we all got honorable discharges. Um, now, after Texas, did you go anywhere else? No, I stayed in Texas till I till I was honorable discharge. What base uh, was your favorite one? I think uh, Virginia, because there was more to do there. They had. Uh, while I was there, I used to go to some of the museums there, and uh, you would walk around downtown, and they had a s service clubs, and they you could walk in there, and they would feed you for free, and you know when you're making sixty bucks a month, you know, so they would feed you, and uh, they had a lot of important people that were working those senators' wives and whatever, but uh, there was a lot to see uh, for free. There was zoos and parks and. But when we got to Texas, it was wide open. And kind of, uh, if you didn't have a car, you were stuck. You know. Uh, what um, did... Uh, have? Uh, what medals have you received? The only medal I received was a good conduct medal. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, on, on your form, you talk some, about some special duties. Um, what Can you tell us a little bit about those? Well, the special duties that I did was 
we did a lot of artwork. And we did work that was, people would come in, officers, and they wanted their, their helmets painted with everything, you know, their captain stripes on the helmets. And, and we weren't supposed to do that, but we, but we did it. it. Kept everybody happy. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I volunteered for the makeup, and I was sent there for, for a couple months with an instructor, and it came out pretty good. Plus, uh, you know, working on the float, we were working on the float on our own time, and it took a couple of months to do it, and we won first prize. Okay, tell me about that float. Well, it was the Battle of the Flowers Parade, and every year in San Antonio, a lot of organizations built a float and put it out. So they, somebody got a hold of our colonel, and he volunteered to build a float. So we had a big meeting, uh, you know, this picture with all the troops there, and he said we were going to build a float. So did everyone help with that float? Everyone yes, in your every, company beef? Everybody that was here attributed something. We made fish, and we had a water, uh, we had a fireproof to float, and uh, the carpenters built a ship type thing. You see, look at it. They built. Yeah, let's see over here. Well, they they built a big ship, and we made all flowers. There was these flowers were real, so they delivered all the flowers. We had to cut them all and put them on the float and there was lights on there and and we had people marching but you know and it, it just was a big project and the, the colonel got all the you know shake his shook his hand and, and he gave us a party so that was all extra that wasn't something we had to do but i enjoyed it mm -hmm. okay um Excuse me. Did any uh, um, entertainers come to see you at the base? Did you have entertainment? Did, did yes, there was a service club, and uh, there would be once a month, a couple of times a year, they would have entertainers come and put on shows and sing and whatever and uh, there was also a couple of uh, theaters on base where you can go to the movies mm -hmm. and they had uh, service clubs there where you can go get a drink which I never did too much because uh, it cost money. What about the entertainers? Were they famous entertainers? Do you remember any uh, of them? No, they weren't. They didn't come to. They mostly came to Washington D.C. and other areas. No, we didn't. We just got people that I didn't know. But we had uh, during that time there was uh, people that were that were professionals. I met a, a boy, a boy, a young man. His name was Bob Miller, and he had played. He was playing for the Detroit uh, the Detroit Lions football team. So he was on our post. You know, he was there. And uh, Elvis Presley came through, but I didn't see him. He came on our post for to the doctor's office, and he was there one day and then he left. But you know, there was so many people, thousands of troops there that, that uh, hmm. probably wouldn't recognize him if you saw him. You know. Did you um, take leave to go home? I took a leave to go home. Yes, I would fly home every so often and. And the longest I think I went was a year and a half without going home. So I just uh, stayed there. And then I got discharged and uh, I really thought about re-enlisting. And I just, my, the Colonel wanted me to go with him to, to Germany. And I said, well, maybe it's time to get out. So I decided to, uh, but I had a lot of uh, training with weapons so when I did get out, 
I applied at Brinks Armor Car and was hired immediately. So I stayed there for about 30 years. How did you get along with um, your op op the officers? And oh, I got along fine with them. It sounds like you had a relationship I with the I had a good colonel. relationship with the colonel, and uh, he was kind of funny because I would salute him, and he would tell me, don't salute me at work <laughs> because you were at work, you know, all day with him, you know. He said, don't do that, just once, that's enough. So. But he wanted me to go with him to uh, Germany for three years. So I, when I told him no, he was kind of upset, but you know, people move on. Because while I was there, we had a lot of people getting discharged, a lot of people getting orders to go to Europe, and a lot of people were getting to go to Korea. And uh, so, you know, we, it, people didn't stay long. I was just lucky to stay there, but the, from the time I got there till I got discharged, it was like a whole turnover. He liked me and he kept me there. Because I told him one day, I said, uh, I'm surprised I'm not moving. He said, no, you're not going nowhere. So I think he did something. Do you remember the day that your service ended? Yes. Being discharged? Yeah. September 30th, yeah, because I went in October 1st, 56, and September 30th, they, I was called into the office and they gave me my discharge papers and shook my hand, and, and uh, I, uh, I took it hard because uh, it was real tight with everybody. I did my job. I had a good rank. And uh, I guess it was just time to move on. But it, it was it was hard to leave. You know, I wasn't I wasn't one of those per people that I wanted to get out right away. I enjoyed it, and I talked to the colonel and some of the people there. And it was tough. Now, did you fly home? Did you? No, fly I had home? bought a car at that time, and I drove home. What kind of car did you buy? I had a 56 Mercury. <laughs> and the friend that went to boot camp with me, El Halise, lived in, uh, he lived in Detroit. So we were in this, he went to Korea. After Korea, he went to Fort Sam Houston, in which, in our outfit. So the day that we were both discharged, I drove him to, to the uh, O'Hare field. So you both were discharged at the, the same, same time. Day. Yeah. And it was funny because when I got on the train to go to boot camp, I sat next to him. And he said, where are you from? And, you know, I started talking to him. So. Do you still stay in contact with I him? I used to stay in contact with him, but I don't know what happened the last couple of years. We just haven't. But, uh, yeah, it was a good relationship. We were all uh, expecting to go to Korea. A lot of them did go, but I didn't go. You know, I don't know why. I was nobody special, you know, where I had any pull or anything, you know. Did your family know that you were coming home, or did you keep it a secret? No, I, uh, I came home and surprised everybody. And uh, it was nice being home. But I missed it. After a couple of weeks, I missed being in the military, you know. I had 30, 90 days to go back, but I, by that time I got a job and just moved, just moved down. So did you start looking for a job immediately? I was, when I came home, I was working in two days later. What I missed was, what I really missed was the weather. Because I came home and I, you know, the end of September, and the winter was brutal, where in San Antonio there's no winter. So that was a real brutal year, you know. Especially working for Brinks, working outside. I used to think, oh my gosh, what am I doing, you know. Have you ever been back to any of the... I clubs? went back to, okay, my daughter grew up and she works for a lawyer's office. Well, she they had an office in San Antonio and she had to go down there for six weeks. So while she was down there, I went down there. 
and I went to the old post and walked around and I went to Brackenridge Park and walked around the the post is an open post so I was able to walk around and look around and it looks the same same buildings same buildings a lot of well there was a lot of changes but basically the same but all new people you did know. you find your um, barracks yeah I went to the barracks and uh, there was an officer there and I told him that I had served before and if I could look in there and he said yeah go ahead so I went up in there and walked around and looked around it was well you figure I've been out of the service 1959 it's been a long time do you, I see you have your dog tags on yeah, do you I, always wear them you no know, once in a while I I put them on just when I'm home alone mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. It just makes me remember. <clears throat> did you join any veterans organizations? No, I never did. I never did. Uh, I just got my veterans card, and uh, I've been down to uh, the veterans hospital a few times, you know, for, uh, uh, well, I have insurance now but I just went down there and, and signed up so that if I ever need anything I can I have my veterans card I could just walk in there and get medical attention you know which I thought was nice I uh, I feel that uh, you know the time that I put in I always felt that it, I did better for the country that uh, I gave something so I always feel good about that. You know, my, my mother came from Mexico when she was a little girl. And my father's people came from Belfast, Ireland. So it was time. They came from foreign countries. So it was time for us to give something back for letting us live here. Did they become citizens? Well, my, 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 my father was born here. And my mother became a citizen, yeah, mm -hmm. later on. And all my brothers that served in the military were born here. So we were all in a hurry to do something. Did you have anything that you kept with yourself or with you um, for good luck? No, just my dog tag. And I, they gave me a medal for the conduct medal, which I always kept. And, uh, you know, there was nothing special, but to me it was one of my stripes. Just a few things that I put on my dresser every so often and look at them, you know. Was this one from uh, your dress? Yes. One was like for the fatigues, and one mm -hmm. was for your Class A uniform, you know, mm -hmm. your 50s. Mm -hmm. So it was funny because uh, when I first went in, they called it the Brown Shoe Army. They called it what? The Brown Shoe Army because I had brown shoes. And after about a year, we had to dye our shoes black. And because we had brown shoes, and... Uh, did they issue you? Yeah, brown they issued us brown shoes, and we had Eisenhower jackets. And then about a year and a half later, they came out with the blues. So I never got rid of my. I they finally had to get rid of it and wear blues, you know, the new the new uniforms. That's interesting. Yeah. So you. I had brown shoes. Did you have brown boots? Yeah, we had brown boots and brown shoes, and uh, the uniforms were brown, and we had brown hats. And uh, if you see on the, on the one picture, I well, see here. These are all brown uniforms. Oh. Khaki color. <laughs> okay. You know, now it's uh, loose. So I was right there on the switch, on the changeover. And the government, you know, they 
when they did that, they just get the uniform and throw them away and give you new ones. So they didn't allow you to keep yours? No. Well, I kept one, but after I got out of service, I, I don't know what happened to it, but no, they, they make you change immediately, you know. Hmm. You know, they get like, okay, October 1st, boom, get your blue uniforms, you know. When you say that you had Eisenhower jackets, can you explain what those are? An Eisenhower jacket is a short jacket, and they had a zipper, like, like this one here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what they call them, Eisenhower jackets. And there was a Class A uniform that we used in uh, inspections. And then they did away with it, and they had a longer coat. And the longer coat was, wasn't as good as the short coat. But you got used to what you had to wear. And they kept that one for quite a while, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. I think it's still today, the blues. You see, today when the servicemen travel, they travel in fatigues. We we couldn't. We had to have Class A uniforms when we traveled. And why was that? Well, that was the rules they had. When we uh, came home on leave, you had to have Class A uniform. You couldn't go in fatigues. Fatigues was only for work or combat. Did you take any military hops? Any military what? Hops. Did you um, fly military planes home? Uh, no, I commercial. didn't, but uh, when we were in uh, boot camp, they they had some old airplanes that they put us in, and they flew maybe for 10 minutes, and the whole plane was shaking, and then they would land, and we would get out and do our maneuvering, but uh, I was always scared because the, you could look right, and you could see the... You can see the the cracks in the plane and everything. They all these old planes, and that's what they would move troops around sometimes, you know. And uh, we would go out and bivouac, and they had tanks, and you had to crawl under barbed wire when they were shooting guns, bullets over you. So you always had to be awake, you know. And then when we would camp out in the bivouac. I was always afraid because the tanks would go by, and I used to think they're going to run me over, you know. But uh, they didn't. Um, I enjoyed my time while I was there. I made, I made, you know, I made a good day out of it, and I enjoyed my time. Mm -hmm. I, you know, a lot of people that were that didn't like it were always complaining. What are some life lessons you learned from your military Well, time? when I came out and got a job at Brinks, you, you can't be alone. You need somebody to help you. You know, you have to have a team. A team. You have to work together. And to get anything done, you need help. You can't do everything alone. You could to some degree, but you need help. and, and one has to watch the other, and friendship is, is a big thing. And you learn to get out, get along with people, and, and ask for help. You can't, sometimes you need help, you have to ask for it. And people that you are married to or, or are part of the family, you gotta take care of each other. And set example for the children. What messages or message would you like to leave for future generation who listen or hear your interview? I think the people in this country have to learn to get along. Uh, when I was a young boy, people would call me names because I was Hispanic to some degree. Uh, so, but that it, it, it doesn't happen anymore. I think people have to learn to live with each other and get along and just be good to each other and uh, just make it a better place for the young people coming up. Is there anything that you feel we didn't discuss during this interview that you'd like to add? No, I think we covered uh, pretty much everything. Like I said, I was never in combat. So that doesn't make you 
not a hero. No, but uh, there was other people that did a lot more. I have a brother who was in, two brothers in Vietnam, so. But I feel that I did what I did and didn't cause anybody any problems and, and left there and after I did a good job and I came home. Well, I would like to take this time and say thank you for your service to our country. Um, I want to also thank you for giving me the honor to interview you today. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's been a big, big honor being here and uh, serving my country. Thank you.